Okay, recording in progress. That means it is time. We get to get started. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to all of you. It's nice to see you. And uh, we've got friends joining us online as well, uh, members of this commission and um, other interested partners who are, are part of the work that we do here. We welcome all of you and thank you for joining us as well. Um, this is the first meeting of the Wasatch Front Regional Council for 2024. Today is Thursday, January 25th, 2024, and the time is 1.37 p.m. We're going to ask uh, if we can just start. Let's start over here in the corner. We'll do introductions all around the table, and then when we're done here in the room, we'll ask Andrea. She'll introduce those online. Rosie Hernandez, Wasatch Front Regional Council. Jordan Chandler, WFRC. Nate Curry, the Communications Manager for WFRC. Ted Nolson, WFRC Deputy Director. Gage Frohr, Weber County Commission. Rob Daly, Mayor of Holiday. Dan Dugan, Salt Lake City Council. Amy Winter Newton, Salt Lake County Council. Scott Wardle, Tooele County Council. Mark Shepard, Clifford City Mayor. Brandon Stanger, Clinton City Mayor. Andrea Pearson, WFRC. Andrew Gruber, WFRC. Ron Ramsey, South Jordan City Mayor. Bob Stevenson, Davis County. Jeff Silverstreet, Mayor of Mill Creek. Ben Nadalski, Ogden City Mayor. Lee Ferry, Box Center County Commission. Beth Holbrook, Utah Transit Authority. Lorraine Kamalu, Davis County Commissioner, but representing Utah Association of Counties on this board. Uh, Carlton Christensen with the Utah Transit Authority, also bodyguard for Ben Hewitt. Ben Hewitt, UDOT. Ivan Marrero, Federal Highway Administration. Sherry Bingham, Harper City Mayor. Bob Nandoy, Roy City. Karen Lang, West Valley City Mayor. Jory Johnner, Wasatch Front Regional Council, Long Range Planning Group. Madison Avilas, uh, WFRC. I'm Nando Matty Stockton. Marsha White, WFRC, Economic Development. Hugh Van Wagen, WFRC staff. Elton Bingham, I'm Hooper City's mayor's husband. Uh, John Larson, Salt Lake City Transportation. Alex Johnson, Congressman Owens' office. Meg Townsend, WFRC staff. Ben Withrich, WFRC staff. Wayne Benyon, also with staff. Tim Watkins, new with staff. Bert Granberg with WFRC's analytics group. Matt Ryan, WFRC staff. Byron Head, WFRC staff. Christy Dahlberg, WFRC staff. Miranda Jones-Cox with WFRC. Marion Florence, Finance, WFRC. Uh, Julie Bjorn said long range planning, WFRC. I almost said finance. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Will you uh, take a minute to make sure to introduce everyone that we have joining us online as well? Sure. Okay. Online we have um, Mayor Tammy Tran. Um, let's see. Commissioner Mike Newton. <laughs> um, Lauren Victor with WFRC. Mayor Mike Weikers, Mayor Natalie Hall, Mayor Eric Barney, Mayor Lauren Palmer, Mayor Christy Overson, Mayor Monica Zoltansky, Mayor Braden Mitchell, Jordan Rosie, Laura Hansen with GOPB, Mayor Debbie Wynn, Ari Bruning, uh, Miranda Jones Cox, Mayor Howard Madsen, and Mayor Joy Petro. Nicely done. And we're going to Welcome, Mayor Burton of West Jordan here as well. Uh, Mayor Burton, West Jordan. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you to everybody here with us today, and all of you here in the room, and also those of you online. We appreciate you being here. We do have uh, one new member of our council with us here today, Ogden City Mayor Ben Nadalski. Um, we're going to see if you want to take just a quick second to kind of introduce yourself. Sure. Andrew asked me to prepare a speech, so just, <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, now, Ben Nadalski, Ogden City, former member of the Ogden City Council, now mayor. Uh, I come here after 23 years with uh, with the state at the Department of Natural Resources, and I'm thrilled to, to be here, thrilled to be in the job. I've had uh, a lot of fun jobs in my life, but fun will never 
beat fulfillment. So jumping out of helicopters was a lot of fun and wrestling out wildlife was great, but this is far more fulfilling and this is already the best job I've ever had. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Mayor, we welcome you and we appreciate your service here and uh, to the good people of Ogden. Yeah, thanks. Mayor Burton had his reptile brain removed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a crustacean, technically. <laughs> I'm going to have to look closer at that hat. Okay, um, we're going to move on to item one here on our agenda. We'll just jump right in it. Um, item 1A, we've got an action item, the meeting, uh, the minutes from our meeting that was held October 26, 2023, and financial statements, and the check registers for September, October, and November of 23. And our budget and expenditure report have been sent out. And so we're wondering if there's anybody has any questions, comments, amendments to make. And if not, can we get a motion to approve those minutes? I'd make a motion that we approve the uh, minutes as numbered to us. Uh, they has, have, as they have been written. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Those minutes are approved. Thanks so much. All right, item two, our chair's report. Um, we've got some exciting things today. We are looking forward to this. So pursuant to WFRC's organizing documents, the Wasatch Front Regional Council Chair makes appointments of WFRC members to the Regional Growth Committee, Transportation Coordinating Committee, or TRANSCOM, as we affectionately refer to it, uh, Active Transportation Committee, the WFRC Budget Committee, WFRC Development, okay, we're going to call it Wasatch Front Economic Development District, I know that, WFEDD, and the Joint Policy Advisory Committee. Some of the appointments to these committees are also made by COGS in the various counties, right? And we, I think we all know that across the region and several other entities, depending on the committee. In the chat, you will find a link to the rosters of the proposed chair, vice chair, members, and alternates of WFRC and the committees that I listed. They were sent out prior to this meeting, but that's there in the chat, so you can pull it up if you haven't looked over that. The majority of the members... Mayor, can I just say, we also, we didn't... Um print them out for all of you because they were sent out, but we have a few copies if anybody wants a copy of those rosters. Just let us know. And Andrea can give you one. Give a wave and we'll run them over to you, pass them down or something. Um, the majority of the members uh, here are continuing their service. However, we do have some new members or alternates or adjustments on several of our committees. Those changes are highlighted in yellow on the proposed 2024 side of your roster. So please take a, a quick minute to review that if you haven't done that yet. I think most of us were part of the discussions that we all had at our COG meetings, you know, and we, we've been engaged in this process. But that's there for you to take a look at. And as WFRC chair, I am presenting the COG appointments and appointing the members, alternates, chairs, and vice chairs of the various committees reflected in the roster as WFRC appointments. These appointments would be effective immediately. And just a, a huge thank you to everyone for the service they've given, uh, those continuing and those who um, are rolling off. We just really appreciate your service on behalf of your individual communities and the region and the entire state. This is important work and we know you, you put a lot of time into it. You attend a lot of meetings, you answer a lot of our emails and you give important input. To this process. We're grateful for all of you who have agreed to be part of this and all those who may be just concluding their service and wrapping up a term. Thank you to each of you. Um, I'm going to see if there's any discussion about this from anyone and then after that ask for a motion to, um, I was going to say ratify, but I think it's officially can, can endorse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the word is endorse uh, these um, appointments. Is there any discussion? Anyone want to say anything? Okay, if not, can I get a motion? Jeff Silvestrini, I'll make a motion to uh, endorse the appointments as presented. Awesome, thanks. We have a motion by Mayor Silvestrini. Is there a second? Second. Thank Jim you. Harvey. Jim, appreciate you, Commissioner. All right, motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of endorsing the appointments to WFRC and all of our committees as members and alternates, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? 
Congratulations to all of you. Thank you for your willingness to serve. And again, thanks to everybody rolling off. Do you have anything you May want I to say? May I make a brief comment? Um, uh, two things. First, thank you. Uh, you're all incredibly busy with your first hats. We know that nobody has WFRC as its first hat. Maybe, maybe for some, it's a second hat. I don't know, maybe, yes? Okay, great. Um, some of you, it's a third hat or a fourth hat. You're incredibly busy. We just appreciate so much your willingness to participate with us, letting us help you. That's our role, is to help you achieve what you want for your communities within a long-term perspective, within a broad regional perspective. And so on behalf of myself and the entire staff, thank you for your engagement again with your communities and then with WFRC. Um, you saw all these at the lists at the COG meetings, but following this meeting, we will send out to you the full final lists that will show the membership by committee and then also by county so that you can be just have a refreshed memory about, you know, who from Salt Lake County is participating in water from Tooele, et cetera. That will be coming out in the days ahead. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Well, we're two weeks into the legislative session now, almost finished with our second week. Um, last week at our first legislative um, policy update meeting that we generously canceled this morning since we have regular council meeting right now. So we didn't have an early meeting at the Capitol and then this meeting after um, the rest of the Thursdays, we will be gathering. If anything changes, we'll let you know. But that that should be the plan is that we'll gather at the Capitol on Thursday mornings for our policy update meetings on uh, at 8 a.m. in the Senate building. Um, last week, we had the um, speaker and the president come and give us some of their time and talk about their priorities. And as far as the work that we do, right? Transportation and transit priorities, infrastructure, um, really good conversation. We also uh, were happy as a WFRC to support Transit Day on the Hill and all of our friends in transit and UTA and everybody else across the state who does transit, but um, happy to get to be part of that. And uh, congratulations to everyone here who was part of the West Davis Corridor opening too. That's happened since we met. That's a big deal. It's a significant like we'd love that to happen in salt lake county so i'm like go davis county good for you um we should celebrate that and we i hope someday before i'm dead we can celebrate something like that in salt lake county until then we're really excited about that and that it's going to help move people along the way it does so we've had a lot going on we're going to turn to miranda jones cox to give us a, an update of, about what's going on um there's always a lot of moving parts there's a lot of good things in the works. so miranda take it away Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, appreciate it and appreciate everyone's uh, engagement thus far uh, with our work on the legislative session. I know that many of you are engaged uh, with your own, with other organizations like our friends at the Utah League of Cities and Towns, Utah Association of Counties. Yesterday was a uh, county a day on the hill and um, UAC actually celebrated 100 years of UAC yesterday, which was really cool. Cool to see that. Um, so I, I, I'm going to give a brief uh, update on where we're at with the legislative session. Um, forgive me if some of this is a little redundant, if, if folks have, have seen some of this information before, but there is some new uh, updates uh, with some bills and appropriations that have come out over the past several days um, that, that is worth sharing. So I kind of want to orient us uh, to, to this. Um, if you look up on the wall, you'll see our mission statement and our role. And uh, when I was thinking about how WFRC uh, works up on Capitol Hill, I thought of these three roles. Um, first is that WFRC serves as a technical expert to uh, legislators while up on the Hill to inform them as they uh, try to make good decisions uh, in policy and appropriations. Second, we're a convener of transfer ag transportation agencies, our partners, etc., our local leaders um, in making those good decisions around uh, around policy. And then third, we're an advocate for those appropriations and policies um, that further the Wasatch Choice Vision and Utah's Unified Transportation Plan. And so while we're up on Capitol Hill, um, I hope we all can, can remember that WFRC uh, is approaching the legislative session with, with this in mind. So real quick, uh, we're only a few weeks into the legislative session. I think we're day 10, maybe, of 45. Um, and the, the legislative landscape, while it shifts throughout session, I, I feel like these three things kind of um, demonstrate well where we're at right now. The first is that 
Uh, there's limited surplus this year uh, compared to previous years. Um, the legislature may not have quite as much one time or ongoing money to appropriate as they have had in years past, um, which will kind of limit their decision making to some extent. Um, and though they have limited funding available, um, we are they are building on years uh, and years of previous uh, significant investments, specifically in transportation. So over the past three years, the legislature has put billions of dollars each year into transportation investment, multimodal transportation investment. You'll remember the funding of the ATIF last year, the Active Transportation Investment Fund, um, one-time funding for projects like the double tracking of Front Runner, uh, and then additional just uh, ongoing or one-time money for uh, transportation investment. So we're hoping that that can kind of, we can build on that moving forward. Um, and, and we do know that there are a lot of great legislative champions uh, supportive of multimodal transportation investment. Uh, and then third, I'd say that kind of the, the big issue on the Hill this year is housing. Um, there's a lot of issues that, that we see during the legislative session, but it definitely is a focus of legislative leaders and how to kind of tackle um, the housing challenges that we're seeing right now. And so definitely something that we're uh, continuing to keep our eye on and, and the, the housing landscape is kind of you know, changing and shifting as we move throughout session. Uh, I wanted to know a few uh, legislative priorities um, that partners or the legislature has shared. Uh, the governor's budget recommendations, those were proposed in December uh, and highlight uh, you know, the governor's budget, how he would spend the state's um, money and, and then they work with the legislature to see if we can get some of those things accomplished. The Salt Lake Chamber, uh, their public policy guide actually uh, echoes a lot of WFRC's um, you know, supported uh, items that, that tie with the Wasatch Choice vision. So I'd recommend taking a look at that. And then the House, um, House majority and minority as well as the Senate majority have put out policy recommendations as well. So we definitely recommend looking at uh, some of those if you want to know more about what they're, how they're kind of approaching the session. So now a few things that we're watching or that are kind of timely uh, now. Um, Things are still a little bit early. Bills are still being released. We're still waiting on bills to be released. Uh, we're also still early in the appropriations process. Um, but notably want to include these, these pieces of legislation. So uh, we'll start with uh, HB 367, which is a transportation utility fee. Um, I, I incorrectly named what the bill is actually called, which I think was local fee amendments or something like that. But um, what this bill is, it's a bill run by Representative Karen Peterson, uh, which would uh, set some guardrails and parameters around uh, cities' ability to impose a transportation utility fee. The Utah Supreme Court ruled um, not long ago uh, that cities can in fact impose that fee and that it is not a tax um, as long as the fee is reasonable. And so the purpose of this bill is to set those guardrails, set those parameters to say, here is how these fees could or should be imposed to ensure that they are a reasonable fee. Um, so kind of just provides a good due process for, for uh, that fee. Um, that, that bill was just released, and so it hasn't really gone through the process quite yet, but uh, WFRC has worked with our partners at uh, the League of Cities and Towns, Taxpayers Association, uh, and the sponsor on that bill. Uh, second bill, and this is one of the bills that as we get to our bill tracker, um, I'll, I'll note it there as well, but this is a bill that WFRC is recommending an opposed position on. Um, this bill, uh, state grant process amendments, um, would, would limit a state agency uh, from uh, providing grant funds um, to to local entities. So it, it would add additional regulations and requirements um, for uh, grant, uh, an entity receiving grant funds to be beholden to, but it also would only allow st the state and state agencies to grant funds to nonprofit entities. So this is challenging for WFRC. We do receive a number of um, funding 
items and programs through state agencies such as UDOT, the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, um, the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. And so if this bill moved forward, we, we likely wouldn't uh, be able to continue to, re to receive those funds. So it's a little bit early. We're not um, trying to, uh, it's a little early on this one. Uh, we're not getting too nervous quite yet, but we just wanted to flag it for this group. Um, we're also not saying like, get out there and you know make sure the sponsor knows. I think um, the governor's office of planning budget is working on working with the sponsor to raise the concerns of uh, state agencies collectively and how it could impact local governments, things like that. But just wanted to make you all aware. Miranda, can I just yes. clarify one thing on that, that bill would say the state can't give grants to you either, to not just WFRC, but to cities and counties. And so we need to make sure this bill doesn't go forward, but we're going to work with the governor's office gently to have that conversation uh, and we'll keep you posted. So as you said, we're recommending a position in opposition to HB 335 in contrast to HB 367, which we're saying we should support and help Correct. get across the finish line. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, also wanted to note uh, HB006, which is the Infrastructure and General Government Base Budget, which yes. include, notably includes, sorry, did you say something? I said S. SB, it is SB. Thank you, yep. Gruber. Senate Bill 6, uh, which includes funding um, for transportation. I'll get to that on the next slide, but wanted to note it here. And then we're also waiting on two uh, bills to be released. Uh, housing and Transit Reinvestment Zone Amendments. You all are likely familiar with um, the HTRZ tool, um, uh, you know, providing the opportunity for, for cities to um, do a development with tax increment financing to uh, support affordable housing costs around um, transit stations. Um, Senator Wayne Harper is again running a bill on this this year, um, largely with some technical clarifications and changes um, with how an HTRZ is administered uh, through the tax commission, through the county assessor's office. They had raised some current concerns with how to actually administer that tax increment. Um, also looking at how to ensure that uh, the affordable units required in an HTRZ um, stay affordable throughout the life of an HTRZ and uh, if, if that affordability requirement is, um, is uh, meeting the, the intended desire of the HTRZ statute. So you're likely to see some uh, minor changes there. And then lastly- Miranda, uh, can I just also add, Senator Harper is not looking to expand the use of HTRZs. There's a cap on the number of HTRZs that are authorized. So he's making modifications within the, he's looking to propose some mod modifications within the existing caps. Yep, thank you, Andrew. And then lastly, uh, the concurrent resolution for recognizing the importance of cross-issue growth impacts. Uh, Representative Bridger Bolander is likely to run the, is to run this legislation. And the idea here, uh, behind the concurrent resolution is to encourage state agencies, local governments, the private sector, um, community partners to ultimately look not at a, a single aspect of transportation or housing um, or water in a silo, but to look at when making policies and recommendations and funding requests around an issue to look at how it is impacted by other factors, right? This idea almost of the Wasatch Choice vision, how do housing and transportation and air quality um, all work together? And um, so the, recommend, the resolution basically recommends um, kind of a, a framework or a, 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 a recommendation to make sure that we're looking at all of those factors at once when making a decision. So. Uh, we're, we're likely to see that come out, hopefully soon. I'll quickly run through a few notable appropriations uh, that WFRC, um, WFRC is supportive of. So the first is uh, additional funding for statewide transit investment. I, we may have mentioned this one before, but included in the, in the governor's budget was a recommendation to transfer funding from the Transportation Investment Fund, or the TIF, 
to the Transit Transportation Investment Fund or the TTIF. Um, it would have been 1% of the TIF to the TTIF um, annually, and which would have equated to about $45 million um, ongoing. And the idea is, uh, we, of course, we're still supportive of this. There's definitely discussions happening around this. Um, it may not be that it's exactly uh, from the TIF to the TTIF. You know, there's, there's many ways that you can accomplish um, getting that funding to the TTIF. But bottom line is that we're ultimately supportive of um, additional, stable, ongoing funding for transit moving forward. Um, it is, uh, you know, a, a, a great need. The TTIF, while it's, um, I wouldn't say it's in its infancy, but it definitely could be, uh, could be bolstered up a bit to continue to um, focus on transit projects throughout the state. Um, the funding as proposed would go through the TTIF again to uh, be prioritized through the Transportation Commission. So Andrew, um, Ben, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add on this one. I'll, I'll add just to briefly, thank you very much. We have talked about this with you before. So Miranda says we support this, meaning we have talked about this as a group already, and it is totally consistent with Utah's Unified Transportation Plan, which gets at providing transportation choices, as does the Wasatch Choice vision. And Miranda, I just briefly will note your point about the mechanisms for this happening. What we anticipate the, uh, the approach that would be ultimately in legislation would be a gradual transition to 1% of the state sales tax going into the TTIF instead of going into the TIF. Rather than taking down the TIF and shifting that money to the TTIF, as our economy grows and as the TIF grows, some of that growth would shift over to the TTIF until that 1% target is reached, and then that would grow with the economy. So that's the idea. And to your point again, and our friends at UTA are acutely aware of this as well, and you, all of you, when you're doing infrastructure, you need to have stable, predictable, and adequate revenue to be able to actually have a program and manage the program. And so we're excited about this. Um, Carlos isn't able to be here today, but I will quote him in saying, publicly in saying, uh, this is UDOT's number one priority this year, is to advance this, um, this uh, TTIF transfer to have a balanced, more of a balanced approach. Thank you. Thanks. We'll see if Ben has anything he wants yeah, to the, add. The only thing I was gonna add is that, you know, it was included in the governor's budget in that original 1% uh, of the, the TIF going into the TTIF, so that's what we presented to our in our budget request, and so now we're answering questions and and providing information as as other discussions are happening. So, awesome, thank you, Ben. And then, uh, lastly, I want to note um, a significant transportation appropriation that was included in the infrastructure and general government base budget. So the base budget is. Um, is the starting budget for existing ongoing funding for state agencies. So UDOT's budget falls within the IGG base budget. And so the legislature at the beginning of session passes the base budgets. Later on in session, they pass supplemental appropriation bills with new one-time funding. Um, and notably, and maybe a little different than they have done in years past, they've included in the base budget a significant appropriation for transportation investments. So uh, the legislature included $775 million in one-time funding and $335 million in ongoing funding of general fund money to be deposited into the Transportation Investment Fund, or the TIF. Um, and uh, it, like I mentioned, it's included in the base budget right now. That, bu that um, bill still needs final passage through the... Um, through the House, I believe. Um, but uh, I will note that we, we kind of had anticipated that this was a possibility of happening. The Legislative um, Executive Appropriations Committee noted that um, they wanted to set aside significant amount of the uh, state surplus to put towards um, potential debt service uh, pay down for transportation debt. 
Um, and while there wasn't any specific language noted with how that um, one over a billion dollars will be spent on transportation in the transportation investment fund, um, they had noted before the importance of or, or the, the desire or intent to um, pay down uh, transportation debt. Um, so anyways, quite notable. Like I mentioned, we've seen significant years of uh, investment in state transportation. Um, and again, we're likely to see that this year as well. Andrew. Yeah, anything? thanks. I want to offer a brief supplement to this too. And continuing the pattern, also ask Ben if he wants to comment on this. Um, this actually started last year. Uh, at the end of session, the legislature adopted in the budget a look ahead saying if the revenues were available, then they would um, use up to $1.1 billion for transportation debt service. As Miranda noted, the Executive Appropriations Committee set that money aside uh, in December, and now they've included it in the base budget. What does this mean? This would mean, presuming it goes through the House, which I'm highly confident it's going to, um, that that money would be uh, available in the Transportation Investment Fund, which is the UDOT account, which is managed through and approved by the Transportation, the State Transportation Commission. And those funds could be used to pay debt service, that is on bonds that are outstanding and that are paid out of the TIF. That's notable because if that happens, then rather than paying debt service in future years, additional resources would be available to go to projects. Also, we've seen significant cost escalation in um, construction projects, so this could help address inflationary impacts. And then to the extent there's other money available still, that money could be programmed through the processes that are in place. We do our transportation plans, and then the commission does the prioritization and the programming, so utilizing the normal processes. So this is good news for transportation investment, of course, for the whole state. Ben, do you want to add anything? That was great. You pretty much covered it. Uh, but just to just to con or reinforce that, you know, with the TIF, this is a is managed as a program. It's we've. It, the stuff that you see here is consistent with what was talked about last year. And as things ch change within TIF, um, it, it allows that flexibility to pay debt service to address project cost increases within that program, which maybe before we just had to move in, in timing. Um, so this gives some additional flexibility there. And then like you mentioned, then it, it has ultimately could, could result in some room for programming. So. Ben, thanks. And to tie this back to the work that we do here at WFRC, the projects that get funded out of the TIF are projects that are included in phase one of Utah's unified transportation plan, right? We, through our process, you engage, your communities engage in identifying transportation priorities. They go into our regional transportation plan and Utah's unified transportation plan. And then UDOT and the Transportation Commission take the first phase of that, the projects identified as being in the first next 10 years, needed in the next 10 years, and then they rank and prioritize and actually program dollars to that. So this is part of the overall process that we have the opportunity to engage in through uh, WFRC in the planning process. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So lastly, I just want to run through some resources and then we'll get to some um, adopting the positions on the bill tracker, but uh, hopefully you're aware of our um, government affairs webpage on our website um, where you can find some helpful information. Each week I'll send out a government affairs email highlighting some of the things that happen during the week, bills that you should be concerned about or, or at least aware of um, and appropriations, et cetera. Um, so those go out every Friday. Uh, we also have our um, appropriations tracker uh, where you can follow the appropriations, what bill they're funded in, um, what's, what's ultimately funded by the end of session. So right now it's a little sparse uh, because we're still in the, the beginning of the appropriations process. But as we move throughout session, um, that will be a little more, uh, a little more robust. And then lastly, our bill tracker, which, uh, which we'll get to. Um, the WFRC bill tracker uh, is, let me pull that up for us. Give me one moment. 
the WFRC bill tracker include staff recommendations for uh, bills during the legislative session. Uh, so we take the uh, position of either uh, support, oppose, or neutral on bills. And, you know, we come to these recommendations, um, not just from, uh, from WFRC's perspective, but also taking into account our partners in the way that they're uh, approaching these bills as well. Um, and so each week, uh, as we meet at the Capitol for our legislative briefings. That group will take a position on the bills in the bill tracker. We did not have that meeting this morning because we opted to have you all join here. Um, but with that, um, Mayor Ramsey, I don't know if you'd be willing to uh, ask for a motion on the positions on the bill tracker. Yeah, thank you so much. Before I do, I wanna see if anybody has any questions, any any questions for Miranda, Andrew, Ben, anybody, Carlton and Beth, anyone, does anybody have any questions for any of you <laughs> about some of the legislation that we've discussed today or anything else? Please. Probably, it's probably more just a comment, but I, you know, I think as we look at this longer range uh, funding solution, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of transit projects uh, that would move things forward in a substantial way. Uh, but to the governor's uh, point and UDOT's, uh, you know, original proposal, until there's a, a really strong funding stream, it's difficult to program those, especially, uh, you know, historically we've been very dependent on discretionary grants and I wouldn't certainly turn a head to those, but uh, you can't move forward as quickly as you would like. And so, to the degree that we find an amicable solution, I think that will certainly help a lot of transit move forward in, in a material way. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know the speaker has said what I think we all, how I think most of us feel that we really um, have a desire for a, a really robust um, transit system, right? And Utah's still growing, still growing up and our transit system is still growing up. Our um, with the Olympics coming, there's a, a, a lot of hopefully opportunity and a lot of um, pressure as well to make sure we get that right. And so that that um, one percent transfer to the TTIF, if the mechanism is, you know, let, let's have it uh, gradually over time from the um, increased state revenue. Great. Yeah, we are definitely um, this organization very supportive of that idea. Um, also, that concurrent resolution, that's the result of so many hours by members of this um, body in different working groups as part of the UEOC subcommittees. Lots of, um, lots of work there um, for the uh, discussion, for the resolution to align these growth conversations and make sure that they are holistic, right? We can't, nothing siloed. We know that water and housing and transportation and economic development, education, none of those things are siloed and they all need to be considered. And so that's that's what that is. That's the reason we're really supportive of that. A lot of work's gone in over the last year to try to help make that happen, to bring um, a heightened awareness of that, right? Um, anyway, a lot of good things here. If nobody has any other questions for Miranda, then I appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Do you, Mayor, please. I have some questions on House Bill 335. Okay, as for grants, okay, now is this like, say, like drinking water couldn't give grants out or UDOT couldn't? I'm going to let somebody Mayor. else take it, but I think yes, I think that's what it means. That's right. Mayor, by the terms of the bill, a state agency could only give grants to a nonprofit organization. Well, I have a concern because some of the smaller communities, we receive grants to do any of our infrastructure process and so is Stockton has received grants to improve their infrastructure and so I'm worried that you know small communities will not be able to qualify to and so we're going to have a downhill slide on smaller and larger so you I take it then you're you're supportive of us being opposed to that bill I have to kind of review it a little bit more but yeah the present my present opinion is I'm against it thank you great yeah, thanks for bringing that up and pointing that out because we don't, you know, our, our um, emphasis here isn't water, even though we're holistic with it. But there, that's, I don't even know that I had thought that far that like the drinking water board couldn't give grants to Stockton or anyone else, you know, um, that, yeah, that's, 
that's the reason that we need to do a lot of work to try to get this uh, bill to a better place that actually works. Small communities live off of grants. Good. Yeah, thank you. I am going to ask if there is a motion, if we can get a motion uh, to endorse the recommended positions as presented by staff today, and we will update those every Thursday and we'll have a chance to weigh in on them. Is there a motion to endorse the recommended positions? Oh, as of today? Oh, Madam Chairman, I'll make the motion that we go ahead and endorse what's been presented to us. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, we have a couple of people who have joined us online. I think I saw Mayor Fippen's name online. Uh, we've had a couple more people, and I don't know that I can, I don't want to miss anybody. I did notice that Mayor Fippen from Far West has joined us. Anyway, anyone uh, who's joined us that we didn't mention before, we welcome you and appreciate your participation here. And want to make note that two of our council members, Senator Harper and Representative Musselman, are excused today. They, they are doing what they do up on the hill and doing their work. So we're going to just, you know, make note that we formally excused them from today's meeting. Um, but we appreciate their their work and their being part of this. I know excuses. I know. <laughs> Commissioner Perry's like been there, done that. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's what it is. Okay, the next item on our agenda is our public comment period. Is there anyone here in person that would like to address the council? If so, uh, you are welcome to come up to the uh, microphone and give us your name and address for the public record, and you can have three minutes to address the council. Okay, seeing none, is there anyone online? If so, please turn on your camera, give us a wave so we know that you'd like to address the council. Okay, seeing none, we will close this public comment period and move to item four on our agenda, the Transportation Coordinating Committee, and we will turn to Mayor Mark Shepard for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we've got two items on our, uh, to report on this uh, at this meeting, we've got a report on our board modifications to the 2024-2029 Transportation Improvement Program, the TIP. Uh, and there's two items uh, for that, and I'll turn the time over to Ben to, to review those. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. So as we have the opportunity, it's going to be a little in slow motion here, but we're going to review the Transportation Improvement Program is an acronym, I hope, all of you are very familiar with Transportation Improvement Program is a program that enables our projects to move forward. Those are the funded projects that have been identified that work through. We're currently uh, functioning then under the 2024-2029 Transportation Improvement Program. So the Transportation Improvement Program or the TIP, it implements the long range plan. It implements the highway, the transit, and the active transportation projects along the Wasatch Front. It helps us meet the short range needs along the front, as well as it provides for the maintenance of our existing system. So as mentioned by the mayor, there are two items on the TIP agenda portion, portion today. The first one is a report on the board modification that Transcom took back in November. In your meeting materials, you will see a copy of the signed resolution and then attached to that resolution, you'll see two tables that identify the projects that were reviewed by Transcom and approved. This information is there. Are there any questions? If not, we'll proceed forward. Is that okay, Mayor? Absolutely, thank you, Ben. Thank you. So we have another board modification that comes before the Regional Council today for your review and approval. There are actually 14 projects. That's five sheets that have the projects on them. We'll go through these projects fairly quickly. And if there are any questions, please let me know. So the first project that we have is a project in Davis County. This UDOT request is on I-15. This is the Shepherd Lane interchange and pedestrian overpass improvements over uh, Park Lane. When this project was, uh, was opened up, the bid exceeded the amount of funds that were available. Sorry, that first one there is the interchange and then there's the pedestrian improvements there on Park Lane. The request, um, of course, with the escalating material, the right of way and the labor and construction on the cost 
um, adds to the reason that it came in well over the engineer's estimate. There's a request that $18 million be added to this project so that this project can move forward. Those funds would come from the TIF program. The next project that we have is a project. This is a project in Weber County. This is on 12th Street or SR 39. This project would go from 47th West up to 1900 West or SR 126. This project would widen this fairly narrow facility to a three lane facility with improvements to the shoulder. This facility is, uh, or this particular project is fairly expensive. There's two types of funds that are going into this. There's a region, uh, what they call the, the region transportation solution program where they, the regions are able to sweep uh, funds that are coming from cost savings on projects. They save them up, they move them forward on new projects or they program other projects um, with the funds that are allocated to them at the beginning of the season. There's also a statewide pot that the state sets aside in transportation solutions. Region one currently has put $5 million into this project and in the statewide, Transportation Solution Program is putting $20 million into this project. Um, they're requesting that we move forward on this project in kind of a phased uh, process where as they move into this project, it is anticipated that this will cost more than the 25 million that's currently programmed. And at that time, we will come back from a request from Region 1 for additional Region 1 TSP or Transportation Solution Program funds. The next project that we have is a project in Morgan. This is up around the Devil Slide Bridge. We've reviewed this project in the past. Uh, those who are familiar, the bridge itself is right there. If you've never had an opportunity to go up I-84, there's Devil Slide. Devil Slide is quite a unique geological uh, formation there, but the bridge that we will talk about is right here. This bridge carries 58 east over the Weber River. This structure is very old and has a lot of complications around it. Besides going under the railroad crossing, the bridge itself is oftentimes underwater when the river rises. Also, the parapets and the bridge are, are parts are just wearing out. Uh, this project will reconstruct this structure but due to the situation that this project, it's kind of in a unique, unique situation here uh, because of the tight work constraints, the winter work window, the river fluctuations, and the UPR property and remote location, the project has the anticipated challenges and increased costs, including additional track monitoring on the Union Pacific Railroad pavement repairs and the drilled shaft heaving, robust river diversions and scheduled slip and temporary structure costs. This project is requesting that we add an additional 2.1 plus million dollars to this project so that it can move forward. The next project that we have is a project up in Morgan. This is on I-84. This will address two bridges on I-84. One of those bridges goes over the Weber River the other bridge is over the Union Pacific Railroad. You can see both of those as uh, the structures as they cross the river and the railroad there. This project has also had some unique circumstances come about from them with the complicated geometry in the canyon and the relationship to the road and the railroad. And working with Union Pacific, Union Pacific has requested that one of the uh, uh, one of the walls, sorry, I'm losing my thought on it, but that they remove one of the detaining walls there, which will create that the bridge going west needs to be extended 100 feet. But also because of there's been um, an increased train operations, minimized disruption to the railroad operations, there are limited windows allowed for the construction work resulting in a longer construction schedule and increased costs for flagging operations. So there's a request there that we add an additional $16 million to this project, making the total project cost of $52 million. 
That brings us to the second table. And the first project on that second table is a project that is in this uh, uh, project in Salt Lake City. It's a project with Utah and Salt Lake City. It's on Foothill Boulevard. It's for landscape improvements and pedestrian and bicycle crossing there on Foothill. You can see the crossing there as well as the landscape improvements along Foothill Boulevard. When this project cost, when the bids were opened on this, the bids came in above the engineer's estimate. Um, Salt Lake City in an agreement has the ability or, or is bringing the 325,000 in additional funds to the project, giving us a total project cost of 1.1 plus million dollars. The next project that we have is a project in Tooele, this project is a UDOP project on SR36. This is to address the southbound direction on SR36. This project will go from Sunset Lane to Stansbury Parkway, and the project will construct a southbound travel lane. Now, since this project was originally programmed, there was a median that was, um, or there was median constructed in the road which would require larger shoulders. And then because of the development that's taken place along with the homes, there's also a need to construct sound wall along the facility. So there's a request that we add an additional $7 million to this project, giving us a total project cost of $14 million. The next project is a project in Salt Lake City. This is on SR 201 over 3200 West. This project has been before this body before. Um, initially, on this particular structure, this project was identified as a bridge deck rehab. But on a routine uh, bridge, uh, what's the word, inspection. When they were out on the bridge inspection on this, they saw that there was some structural fatigue that was taking place on this particular structure. So the urgency on the improvements for this bridge required that in the consultation that perhaps they close this facility while they do the improvements on the structure itself. Part of the improvements there on this would address the bridgeway. Well, let me go back. There's generally on the average of about 114,000 vehicles that cross this structure um, on 201. It's a big deal to close this facility. So, as they begin to identify solutions for it, the project that was initially identified on 5600 West, which would also address the deck improvements as well as some of the structural improvements to 5600 West, it was identified that improvements to the ramps on these facilities would be improved to facilitate the transportation maintenance plan when the SR201 bridge was closed. So it would require an additional 4.3 plus million dollars being added to this project for a total of $13.8 million. Correct. Use your, use your mic. Region one, we're a little... Use your mic if you want to make a comment. I was just gonna say region one, I think our living is a little better than region two and that's why we don't have that problem. Thanks, Commissioner. I, I for pointing out, I'm jumping back and forth between the regions. Um, as you, the way the tables are built, a lot of times we'll have projects have additional funding, or we'll have additional funding with scope changes. So we try to uh, lump the right projects all together. But this next particular project is a pavement rehab up in Region One. This is a project in Davis County. This is on SR 126 or Main Street or State Street. Uh, this is to do payment rehab. Initially, this project was identified that they'd go through, they'd mill out, and they would put in a one-inch overlay. As they were doing the investigation and the preparation for the project, they identified significant rutting through the intersection of 193. Um, in their plan, they recommend that there be a one inch um, mill and overlay along this facility, especially down around the the curbs and the gutters, and then through the intersection there that they do a, a two-inch mill and fill 
for this particular facility, that would require that there was $950,000 added to the project, bringing that project total cost up to five plus million dollars. That brings us to the third table, which identifies four more projects. This next project is also in Davis County. This is on US 89. This is for a pavement rehab and replace the concrete panels. Um, this project would go from SR 193 up to the Weber River. Now, there's been a lot of work along US 89 here, but the project stopped prior to this section. In fact, in this particular section, it was recommended that they go in and they replace the asphalt here as well as remove the concrete panels that are in the southbound climbing lane. Um, while they were looking at that, it was identified that in addition to this, there was one section highlighted right here in orange that is being overlooked. The project on US 89 from Farmington um, going to the north, sorry, dropping. Anyway, that it was left off of the major project. So the scope of this project is to change and add this pavement project to this particular project um, that would overlay, mill and overlay 1.5 inches along 89 um, from the Weber River all the way up to where the existing US 89 Farmington I-84 project terminated. That total project cost will be 6.4 plus million dollars. The next project here is in UDOT, or this in Salt Lake. It's a UDOT project on 114 South. This is for a full bridge replacement. This is from the bridge formula program. This particular project is a project that's shared between Draper and Sandy City. It is on a federal aid eligible facility meaning that because of the bridge formula program, it will require that there's a local match being paid. Both Sandy and Draper in agreement and concur with the needs for this project it is in low to poor condition. And so this project will be, will replace this particular structure. Here's a picture of its existing condition. This project here is estimated to cost uh, $3 million, 2.7 plus would come from the bridge formula and 200,000 plus would be local government match. The next project is actually four bridges. These bridges are all through Sandy City. Um, one of the bridges is on the Jordan Salt Lake Canal on 106 South. The other three are over the East Jordan Canal one at 106 South, one at 9400 South, and one at 80th South. Um, real quick, the bridge on 106 South over the Jordan and Salt Lake Canal. Current conditions on that bridge. The next bridge on 106 South. The mayor South. of that would really love this to go through. I'm just saying, did you see that picture? Yeah, thank you. Denied. No. The next bridge here is a little further east on 106 South. This is over the East Jordan Canal. And you can see there's an existing picture of that structure. This is, yeah, this is region two again, isn't it? Yeah, okay, just checking. The next project is on 9400 South and this is also over the East Jordan Canal. This particular bridge, there it is. And then the last structure on India South over the East Jordan Canal, there's a, an existing condition on that particular bridge. So these four bridges would be reconstructed. Two of these bridges are on federal aid eligible or on, on system. So they would require local match from Sandy City. Sandy's well aware of the project and is um, on all four structures and is prepared to meet the local match. Total estimated costs on all four projects is 9.4 plus million. Well, he, yes. Yeah, those structures yeah, were all in are, Sandy. These are right here, Mayor. They're they're right right bordering your city and mine with Sandy. Yeah. The one on 80th is bordering yours. Yeah. They're good. Um, the next project is on Salt Lake City. This is 
Uh, the UTAS line extension. This particular project, if you're familiar with the current S line, it goes from about 2000 plus west to the east to about 1040 east. Uh, this is to extend this project from 1040 east up to Highland Drive. This particular project will bring several benefits to the project with the support of the economic development, as well as enhanced reliable transportation to the Sugar House area, provide alternative vehicle traffic for those in the area as well as those visiting and improve the connection up to Sugar House. This particular project, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's anticipated that the construction cost will be 16 million. And in that uh, vehicle, an additional vehicle would be 7 million. Currently legislation in House Bill 433 has approved $12 million for this project. UTA has committed $1 million. There's a, about a $10 million uh, gap, and both Salt Lake City and UTA are working on that to identify that those remaining funds so that this project can move forward. That brings us to our last table that has just two projects, and both of these projects are related to um, Senate Bill 185, or something that Miranda mentioned earlier about funding that was allocated for active transportation. This bill allocates $45 million in ongoing funding and $45 million one-time funding for the specificness uh, of UDOT to build, operate, and maintain paved regional trail network throughout the state. This particular project uh, or I might add, as the state has moved forward, um, they are they're preparing a lot. They're preparing the guiding principles, and this request here is develop to develop to hire a consultant to develop the first phase of the long term plan for the Utah Trail Network. So this particular project request is for a new project for six hundred thousand to hire the consultant to carry that forward. The next project is also dealing with the, the, the Utah Trail Network. Um, and this one here is to um, hire a consultant that'll work on the scoping and the estimating support for upcoming Utah Trail Network projects. Ben, this, can, may yes. I just go ahead, finish your I was just going to say that this project is 245000 This is also a new project, and that would conclude all I have, Andrew. Thanks. Just on this last element about the Utah Trail Network, you all, those of you that were able to attend our last round of Wasatch Choice workshops that we did around the region may remember we laid out the maps on the tables and you were drawing in potential locations for trail enhancements. That's represents our work as local governments, your work, our work together to provide input into and our collaboration with UDOT on the development of the Utah Trail Network. That's the state owned and maintained trail system, paved trail system that complements what we call the Beehive Bike Network, which is a term for the locally owned and maintained trail system that all integrates uh, together. So the work that Ben is describing here that UDOT is working on, we're doing in close collaboration um, with UDOT. Thank you, Andrew. Mayor, that concludes the item. Thank you, Ben. Are there any questions for Ben? Okay, seeing this, I've oh. just got questions on those two bridges, the same kind we got homered on that 106 South nonsense down there. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, never mind. We're all here to support. Mayor Zoltansky in those bridge enhancements, and they are right on the border of both of our cities as well. But you know, oh, I know, I know, but this has to pass. Let's just say that. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to congratulate Mayor Zoltansky on presenting the most awful pictures of the bridges to get the get the grant. I'll just add a little bit. So those those bridges that you see there, they're part of what we call the bridge formula program. This is a new new program, new federal program. So thank you, Ivan, for this program. It's, um, it's, allowing, it's allowing us to get to a lot of bridges that previously were very hard to get to. I, you probably all noticed on those pictures, some of those bridges, you can't even tell that you're driving over a bridge. And 
Yeah, I'll just mention that it, it, it always is the highlight of our Transportation Commission meetings when we show the pictures of underneath those bridges in this program. Everybody's like, ooh, ah, you know, like all the <laughs> all the exposed rebar and everything. But it's, it's a great program to be able to get to a lot of bridges that we haven't been able to get to before, a lot of local bridges. So there's there's a big list. I think we started with a list of 90 bridges on that list. And so you'll see more as we work our way through that list of, of bridges. Thank you, Madam Chair. Then I would uh, move that we approve the, uh, the resolution to modify the 2024-2029 transportation improvement, improvement program as, as requested. I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Hey, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Awesome. Thank you. That concludes my report. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, Regional Growth Committee, we're going to turn to Mayor Bob Dandoy. Thank you, Mayor. I will tell you, it's hard to uh, come after the uh, the Mark Ben show. They uh, they have a tendency to spend an awful lot of money, so we do appreciate that. Uh, Madam Chair, we'd like to talk about the Regional Growth Committee. Um, and by the way, we had a great meeting. Uh, a lot of information was shared in that meeting that uh, I was absolutely unaware of, and so it was a good thing. Uh, one of the key things we want to talk about is the guiding principles to follow as we update our regional plans <clears throat> over the next few years. Now, the Wasatch Regional Council updates our plans as needed and not, not less than every four years <clears throat> to address the changing uh, conditions. Now, as we plan together for the future, we need to be in spiral about the community we want to have as well as continue to grow be pragmatic and prudent about our cost and resilient resilience about our change. I just like to point out if I can uh, just discuss eight goals, uh, guiding principles that come out of that meeting. Um, I'll let you kind of look through those. Uh, I just like to point out maybe if I can three of them to draw your attention to. Uh, certainly these are goals and principles we're working towards. Uh, number two on the list, the coordinating transportation land use and economic development. Those are very important principles that are weaved into everything that's taking place because they're so interrelated. Uh, I wanna draw your attention to the explore policies that complement and optimize transportation investments. It is all about trying to find optimization and, uh, and making sure that we're spending our money well. And then the last one, the balance of planning for growth and transportation capacity, certainly uh, the maintenance and operation, the local needs and the flexibility in responding to the changing circumstances. Uh, these are all great principles. I wanted to highlight a couple of ones that certainly impact all of us in many different ways. So with that, of course, we'll be continue to keep the Wasatch Front Regional Council, okay, informed about how the Regional Growth Committee is functioning and all the work that's being done in that committee. So with that. Mayor Dandoy. Please. May I add just very briefly two points um, to what you're describing here. The, the first is uh, Mayor, our chair, Mayor Ramsey, had to step out for just a moment, but she had told me earlier that she had intended to highlight another one of these. And so given that she's not here in the moment, I will do that for her, Let's do. Um, which is number four, explore aspirational opportunities for transportation and land use balanced with pragmatic consideration of costs. We're growing so fast and we need to be able to not be constrained in our thinking by the availability of resources think about what the types of infrastructure investments and land use development that would promote the best quality of life, but of course being prudent and pragmatic in the resources that are actually available um, and being as efficient as possible. So she wanted to emphasize that. I like um, it. The second thing I'll note is that this set of uh, principles for our work actually also, it's not just coming out of WFRC, right, Ted? It's also reflecting dialogue that we have had with our Unified Transportation Plan partners, UDOT, UTA, Mountain Land Association of Government, all of us working collaboratively and pointing towards the future. Yeah. Okay, yeah thank great, you. Great, great comments. Um, uh, we certainly have a lot to deal with, and we're excited about this because this is a collaborative effort. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we do have one action item, Madam Chair, and I assume she will pick that up when we're, uh, we're there. Uh, we certainly want to talk about uh, another big event, and that certainly is the stationary plan certification request that we've got, uh, 13 of them sta stations in our downtown Salt Lake City. Uh, let me just, if I can, preface that. It certainly come out of the Regional Growth Committee, so let me talk about that, and then we'll turn some time over to Megan. 
the Regional Growth Committee is making recommendations to the Council today to certify 13 stationary plans in our downtown Salt Lake City. A stationary plans is the local effort to work through the planning and zoning details around transit stations and in key areas of effect accommodating growth. Many of our Wasatch Front choice centers are developed around these transit stations. And certainly Roy has one, and we're sent, putting a lot of focus, okay, with our UTA partners in terms of how we're going to move forward with that particular uh, area. Now, under Bill House Bill 462 from 2022, cities with transit stations are required to develop transit areas plans. Cities decide how to do it and maintain their local control over land use. Let me rephrase that, okay? We have a say in terms of how it's supposed to come together, and we could not be more excited about that arrangement. But I also recognize it is a stakeholder partnership to make that work. The, front, the Wasatch Front Regional Council is giving the responsibility to certify these stationary plans and satisfy the statutory requirements. Now, that's the basis to the comments we're going to have. We're going to turn some time over to Megan now and let her introduce this next item, action item, for your consideration. Megan? Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is really fitting after going from a conversation about our Wasatch Choice, you know, going forward goals, um, implementation of the Wasatch Choice is really evident in the work of the station area planning, and, and we're really pleased to get to work with all of your communities on that. So as Mayor Dandoy said, we get to consider... 13 stations for certification today, which is very exciting, very good for our data in getting this work done, and also um, just a really great opportunity to highlight our metropolitan center, right, our Salt Lake City downtown. Here's a quick update about how it's going, and so we have this timeline that you've seen several times now moving these, each of these station areas, each, each segment of that half mile radius or quarter mile radius um, in, in the various communities toward implementation. We've certified four of these stations so far. We have 13 now for consideration all in one big batch. We don't have any adopted that are sitting, um, waiting to be submitted for certification, but we have 56 station areas that are somewhere in the planning process right now. So, so many of your communities are working hard to get this done. And I'll say we've had a lot of fun um, helping, honestly. It's just ex exciting planning to, to see what a station area could, could be. We also have received 19 applications for station area plan technical assistance. So that's technical assistance funding that we have in partnership with GOEO, UTA, and the Mountain Land Association of Governments to help you do this work. Um, we've, we've received 19 applications and many of those 56 stations are being planned using that funding and, and our assistance. So um, that's really great to see everyone. Those, that is available anytime to your cities. You can put an application in anytime and um, you can call me anytime about it too. And we'll, be, we'll go ahead and process that and get, get you some support. Here's a reminder of our station area plan goals. Those, increase in, those include increase the availability and affordability of housing, promote sustainable environmental conditions, enhance access to opportunities and increase transportation choices and connections. Now, usually I talk about the components that are required to be part of a station area plan. Today, I wanna talk about the prior actions component of this statute. So, we have the ability based on the state code to certify a station area based on prior actions that that city has taken. Um, this is for cities who've made strides already in transit oriented development. They've, they've created the places and they've demonstrated that they have the, the plans and the policies in place to continue doing that work. Um, so they're not, it's not saying, hey, you're done. You've got a perfect TOD. It's just saying, you know, you're all set up to, to make this happen and to meet those objectives. Those prior actions might include things like adopted plans and ordinances, approved land use applications, it might be agreements or financing, um, it might be a CRA, right? And it could be investments that you've made in your downtown like bike lanes and things like that. So we're looking for all of those and a city can kind of make their case for whether um, they've met these prior actions. We have to also be able to see that those prior actions are substantially, they're, they're able to substantially promote each of the objectives and relevant to making meaningful progress going forward. So we're not just looking at um, if you've done things, we're looking at if you've done enough and if you can keep going and making progress. And so that's what we looked at when we considered these 13 downtown stations. We didn't go and do a brand new plan with um, Salt Lake City. 
So Salt Lake City has submitted a resolution. They adopted a resolution um, making their case for all of these prior actions that they've um, been able to complete. And that's what we're gonna consider today. And I'll just remind everybody that we adopted a policy when the station area plan legislation was first um, passed. We adopted a policy to look at these things through a lens of reasonableness. So we're putting on our reasonable caps today and we'll consider these, um, these station area uh, actions. So here are our 13 stations downtown that we're considering today. Those include 900 South, 600 South, Courthouse, Gallivan, City Center, Temple Square, Arena, Planetarium, we're sitting right in those stations now, Old Greek Town, Salt Lake Central Tracks, Salt Lake Central Front Runner, North Temple Bridge Guadalupe Tracks, and North Temple Front Runner. I put this image from our online map up there just so you can see just how interwoven these station areas really are. So we're considering 13 stations, but we're really considering just this, you know, maybe two mile stretch of station area. Um, they're not spread out like you see in most of our region. They're kind of clumped together. That said, we did take a look uh, um, in our staff analysis at each of these stations with each of those four object objectives. So we made sure that each station stands on their own um, and we're not just kind of certifying the blob although it is kind of tough to differentiate because you just have this wonderful downtown and the half mile radius is pretty large when you think about it that way. So most of this area is covered by the Salt Lake City downtown plan. That's um, in the shades of red there on that screen, but there are other plans I wanna mention that do cover this area, including the ballpark station area plan, which we actually certified that specific station um, first, or I think in um, last year, maybe second, second. The West Side Plan, the North Temple Boulevard Plan, Capitol Hill, the Avenues Community Plan, and the Central Community Plan. So a lot of adopted um, Salt Lake City plans touch this area, but that downtown plan covers the majority. In addition to all of those plans, the prior actions that the city has, has done um, go well beyond that. That includes ordinances and different transit-friendly um, investments and things. And I'd like to have our friend, council member Dan Dugan speak to some of those. Speak. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, WFRC for all this. And I'm just gonna go back to the uh, mission statement of convener. And I think of that more as a uh, senior uh, experienced cat herder, because we have a lot of priorities here of moving people uh, efficiently across our area, not cars, but people. And uh, I want to thank UTA for providing the safe, reliable mode to move these people through the area. And our stationary plans wouldn't be effective without that reliability and that safe transportation across the city. You saw that map, but that's 13 stations. And I think Salt Lake City has nearly 26 or just under 30 stations uh, in our jurisdiction from the airport all the way up to the university and the, the hospitals. The S line we did when we, did, we just discussed uh, a few moments ago on, on the growth there. So we've been working on development around these stations and it's uh, because we have the reliability of transportation, it's, I don't wanna say it's easy, but it makes it a lot uh, easier for us to do that because we wanna focus on our quality of life for our residents and our people coming in here. And we can do that. Uh, it makes it easier because we have those areas there and, we, and developers want to come there. They want to develop there. Downtown's population is going to double in the next year or so. And that speaks volumes because of these stationary plans. We made uh, off street parking a little, uh, shrunk that so we can develop the housing there. We're doing mixed income housing and mixed size housing. We want to make sure we have family friendly housing, not just studios and one bedroom apartments. We're, we're expanding that side of the house. We've changed some of our height zones in the uh, downtown area to, so we can actually also build uh, higher units. And uh, we really wanna make that not just housing, but uh, affordable living so that you can walk out your door, you go to the coffee shop, you go to the restaurant, you go to your daycare, and you don't need to be in that car. And you can eliminate one of those cars if you have a two car house. So uh, bottom line, the city's working on it hard with the developers and with our councils to make this happen. We're a good example of good planning and good transportation because it makes it easy for development to happen around those transit zones. And it's happening up down fourth south and throughout the city. So appreciate everybody's efforts and appreciates the partnership, the funding 
and um, the support. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Norris, do you have any questions or, or comments, excuse me, not questions, comments from the, from the planning department? This, the experts here talk specific. specific. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I'm Nick Norris, I'm the planning director for Salt Lake City and have overseen most of the efforts related to our planning in our downtown and over the last 13 or so years. But um, I like to start, and I said this to the Quality Growth Commission last week, is that we've we've been doing station area planning before it had a name, before it had a cool, a cool moniker and it was a thing to do. Um, our first adopted plan of the city, I think a lot of people have heard of the Plat of Zion, but the first official adopted plan of the city from the early 1900s identified growth and development around our streetcar network. And most of that still exists, even though the streetcar has been gone for you know 70 years now. Um, but as a city, we've taken that to heart with the exception of a period in the you know 1950s through 90s where I think we all lost track of what we were, but um, <laughs> we're doing a lot better. Um, and just to give you some highlights in this plan, when it was adopted in seven or eight years ago, um, it set a goal of completing 10,000 new housing units in our downtown by 2040. We're gonna, we actually have achieved that as of the last certificate of occupancy we issued a couple months ago. So um, in less than eight years, we've achieved a 25 year goal. Um, we have a very aggressive adopted goal to add 10,000 more in the next five years. Um, that's through our housing plan that um, we're working on. And we've made in, we, we continue to make various investments, not just in housing, uh, particularly affordable housing, but also in our um, transportation network. And as our transportation director, John Larson says, in the original modes of transportation using our feet. Um, and th those are priorities that we've not only invested money in, but built into our codes for certain requirements. And so it's, we don't view this as a one and done type of thing. We'll, we are constantly working on improving our urban environment, particularly around our transit stations, and we look forward to our future uh, certifications. I mean, we, we're right now, if, if this is certified, we will have certified 82% of all the station area plans that this body has certified. Um, and when we're done, we'll have something like, I think, 48% of all the station areas in this entire system. Um, and fortunately, we have plans uh, for uh, all except a few of the streetcar lines and that are actually in South Salt Lake, but we have to do a plan for because a portion of the area is in Salt Lake and then one station in West Valley City where it's some of the same thing. So um, expect to see more of us over the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Dugan and Nick. Okay. So you have everything in your packets to be able to consider this for certification. You have Salt Lake City's downtown resolution. You have our WFRC, our unsigned WFRC resolution that would then certify these stations. And you have our staff analysis of this um, that does go station by station and looks through these objectives. And there's, there's a lot of great information about all the great work that Salt Lake City has done in there as well. So staff has reviewed this and we, we do make a positive recommendation. We reviewed this according to our WFRC adopted policy and in consultation with UTA. And when it was presented to Regional Growth Committee last week, they also recommended that this um, council body go ahead and certify or vote to certify um, these station area plants. So I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair and see if there's any questions. Mayor, anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, I just indicate to you, it's an incredible effort on their part, uh, certainly 13 and counting, and uh, it's going to move us really getting these uh, legislative requirements done. Uh, may I make a point uh, this? Please take the time as you integrate, okay, and you interface with our legislators that when they do pass the laws, okay, and certainly this is a big one in 2022, action is happening. We're making it work, and we just need the time if they'll give us the time to prove that we can really make a difference when they pass legislation. So here's another example. This gives us 17, okay, when this is done, if this, if this council will approve this, that's 17 of these things done. And I'm telling you, it was just a few weeks ago that they passed that legislation to ask us to do this. 17 and counting. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, anybody have any questions 
from Megan. And if not, um, there's a proposed motion, right? Yes. Yeah, I'd love to put that up there for a suggested motion. But first, let me see. Anybody have any questions for Megan? Or for Salt Lake City or anybody else? Jeff? So, Madam Chair, uh, Jeff Silvestrini, I, I want to move to certify these 13 downtown Salt Lake City station areas. And I also want to commend the planning staff, Nick, uh, uh, Yeoman's work to get this much done at one time. And as your neighbor to the south, uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm, uh, I admire the work that you've been doing. And I've, and I, you know, we're watching and paying attention. I think some of the things that that Salt Lake City has done around the S line and Sugar House are also, um, you know, a catalyst for for growth in other areas like our town center. Uh, so this is great work, and I'm happy to see you guys making this much progress and being a leader on this. So thanks. I'll second, second that. Oh. <laughs> well i like i'm right in the middle of both of you so i'm not gonna <laughs> okay we're gonna give that to, to say Mr. i respect Sanger. my elders <laughs> well brandon that money you wanted in uh clinton city just got cut off <laughs> We're going to give the second to Mayor Stinger so that his city still gets money from Davis County. And uh, with that, we have a motion and a second to certify the 13 downtown Salt Lake City stationed areas. Um, any additional discussion, comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Awesome. Congratulations to Salt Lake City, and thank you for all the work on this. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mayor? I do have a comment. Yes, yesterday, our city council passed off three stationary plans for West Jordan, and I signed them this morning, so they should be coming to your desk right away. But, you know, I already reviewed them and signed them, so that'll save you some time if you want to just approve it. It's his birthday. So. It's my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mayor. Anyway, so that's half of them was in West Jordan, and we did it in conjunction with uh, Midvale. So South awesome. Jordan will be getting with you for the others. Yep. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, item six, 6A. Six we, we have a conversation about some potential impacts of federal ozone air quality standards. Uh, we're gonna turn to Andrew and Bryce Bird with the Utah Division of Air Quality to talk through uh, some, this is a little sticky. So Andrew, take it away. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, some of you have probably, this issue is probably on some of your radars already about ozone. Um, this is a, a complicated issue that is challenging for our region. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have Bryce Bird. We're thrilled to have Bryce Bird, who is the uh, director of the Utah Division of Air Quality uh, with us. He knows more this is not hyperbole, he knows more about air quality than anybody um, in Utah, and so we're very happy to have him here. Um, I'll just briefly introduce this. So Wasatch Front Regional Council, as an organization, has a responsibility with regard to air quality that we have to uh, confirm that the transportation plans that are adopted conform to the applicable air quality standards, all right? Otherwise, under federal law, those transportation plans cannot move forward. The projects can't move forward. That's a role that we have as a metropolitan planning organization. Ozone is one of the pollutants that is measured, and there are standards for ozone. Um, ozone is particularly challenging for us because, and Bryce is going to cover this in a little more detail, but because 86% of the ozone that is in our atmosphere, in our area, comes from so-called background sources that we don't control. They, it either blows in from the West, from California, and even from China, uh, or it is produced by natural sources, pine trees and other natural sources that interact in the air and produce ozone. So we only control 14% from human-caused sources. And we've actually been doing an amazing job in terms of emissions, most notably from transportation, reducing emissions from that we're putting into our environment. So the air is getting cleaner, emissions are declining, but the standards that the federal government, that the EPA establishes for how much ozone is allowable in the atmosphere have been coming down. 
So we've been doing better, but the standards have come down to the point that we are now not meeting those ozone standards. Now, I just wanna say, it almost goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that we care a lot about the emissions that go into our air because it matters for human health. This is a critical issue that we've worked on for, for many, many years, cleaner vehicles, promoting transit and biking and walking, all of these things, we're working on it. But we face this regulatory challenge now and the implications are potentially very significant in that we could face a freeze of transportation planning. Our regional transportation plan, our transportation improvement program could be frozen, meaning we can't make any changes to them. And then after that, there could be a lapse in which we would actually not be able to spend transportation dollars on regionally significant projects. Not just road projects, but also transit projects. Seems peculiar. That's the way the rules work. So this is a really significant potential issue. And Bryce, I know you're, that I'm saying some of the things that you're also going to say, but I just wanted to crystallize it before you go into it, because it's, it's really important and it can be rather complicated. So Bryce, please. So I was probably gonna highlight as well. So Andrew and I have talked many times uh, we have a uh, current board member, Mayor Silvestrini, uh, actually a, a former employee in uh, Mayor Mele. So uh, got a lot of expertise here. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the regional council today. We've, we've uh, of course, participated in, in a number of the other committees uh, in the past as well. So when we talk about uh, air quality planning, sometimes uh, if I could, we have to put two hats on. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, we have what's right for the, for the area, what's right for the people. We, we do things and we have done things for a long time. Actually, I'm very proud of the fact that the Utah Air Conservation Act actually predated the Federal Clean Air Act. And so the legislature in Utah uh, thought it was appropriate to address this through a, a, a Air Conservation Act before uh, the federal government put the Clean Air Act in place. And so it, it is a, a situation we've been trying to solve for a long time and the work is going to continue despite what I'm gonna say next. We also have to put on our, our regulatory hat. Uh, EPA uh, through Congress uh, is, uh, directed to set the standards, uh, directed to uh, define the implementation process. And we are delegated certain authorities under that process, but uh, ultimately, uh, if we can't meet the standards, there's hammers built in the Clean Air Act that I'll discuss here shortly. Uh, also highlight that uh, this is a, a, a DEQ and UDOT slide. Uh, as was mentioned, this is a, an issue for the state, something that uh, we're trying to, to work through. Mention one more last thing is uh, maybe some of you are familiar with Senate Bill 57. And this is the state sovereignty uh, bill that uh, Senator Sandel's working on. Uh, the two things that he's highlighting in his presentations are the, the ozone issue and uh, the, the, the transport, which is also an ozone component of the Federal Clean Air Act, as maybe some of those things that, that may be involved in the future process that's anticipated by that uh, state sovereignty, sovereignty amendment. So uh, again, not that we're not gonna continue addressing um, air quality, not that we, uh, again, shouldn't because it, it is a, a concern for us, but sometimes we, uh, as I'll highlight, to have this uh, regulatory challenge that we have to work through as well. And sometimes it's a legal challenge that we challenge in the courts as well. Okay, next slide. So you can't have an air quality presentation without a graph. And so here's my graph for the, that, that check. Uh, under the Clean Air Act, uh, EPA sets the standards. The dashed lines that go through the actual monitored values represent the, the levels of the standard. So the standards have uh, ratcheted down, become more protective over time. And uh, even though over the past many years, we've seen great progress at meeting those standards, over about the past 10 years, you can see that the ozone levels that were monitoring the valley, despite local reductions of 35% from one precursor and 30% from another precursor have been flat during that 10 year period. A couple of reasons for that, uh, we've seen an increased influence from wildfires, we've seen hotter and drier summers, and we form ozone in our, our metropolitan areas, typically when we have temperatures over 90 degrees and sunshine, and the past few summers, we've seen a little, we've, we've seen more of that, uh, clearly. The, the monsoon hasn't been as prevalent during the summertime, so we've had more days where we had the conditions in place where we could form ozone. And then, uh, Andrew also highlighted the, 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 the impacts, and, and that is that the, the, the hammer under the Clean Air Act, is the sanctions that could be put into place that actually first apply uh, to transportation. Next slide. As far as the, the timing and timelines, uh, as was mentioned, uh, we created a state plan for ozone. 
but we didn't show that we're attaining the standard. Uh, we didn't find enough controls to be able to meet that standard. Um, and so that uh, puts us in potential EPA has that in their hands right now in the next year, uh, as, as early as October of 2024, they could uh, act on their, that plan. And again, we know that it doesn't meet all the requirements. So the action will probably be a disapproval, which then first triggers the, the transportation freeze, the conformity freeze. And that means that if uh, projects aren't already in that, that uh, first four years of the transportation plan, that, uh, that they, they could not proceed at that point. It also starts a two year uh, clock for us to uh, either amend our plan, uh, ident identify enough controls to bring the area back into compliance, uh, or we are susceptible to the next one, and that is the, the sanctions, the, the, the more stringent and uh, prescriptive part of that. Uh, one of the highlights from that um, that uh, is also difficult to explain, and that is uh, even using state funding for regionally significant projects is not allowed under that sanction scenario. And so even the state can't use their own funding for those projects that, that fit in there as well. Just everybody hear that? It's, this is, we're not only talking about, even to federal standard, we're not only talking about restrictions on federal funds, we're also talking about restrictions on local, state and local funds. So if we have a problem, <laughs> we don't get any money to fix it? Uh, I, I guess uh, th here's where the, the art of air quality regulation comes into play. Um, California has been in the same situation for 30 years. Um, one of the things, some of the sanctions that EPA has, a sanction authority under the Clean Air Act, they also have some discretion. And part of that is making sure that you're showing reasonable progress at, at meeting the standard. Uh, and so, uh, again, there's no guarantees in that process, but we're, we're working to that. And I'll, I have a slide that identifies kind of the, the four tiers that we're, or four things that we're doing to try to address this. And uh, I'll hit those in a future slide. But again, this is coming more quickly than we wanted. And uh, again, this is, I know for many of you, this is your first exposure to this, but uh, uh, again, something that uh, we as planning folks have been discussing for a while. Next slide. I think it's also covered uh, some of the currently planned projects that could be in jeopardy uh, from this process. Again, roadway projects and transit projects. And next. And uh, as Andrew mentioned, <laughs> thank you. But here's my bar chart to, to, to emphasize that, another air quality discussion requirement. Um, that big blue bar is the ones that we can't do anything about. Uh, that, that is the, the natural background uh, or transported emissions that come into our area. Um, and then even what's beyond that, some of those other blocks are either natural sources of ozone or internationally transported uh, so sources of ozone. So what we can control locally is a very small portion. And uh, there's also preemptions in the Clean Air Act for what we can actually have regulatory authority for, and that even cuts it down more. So even if we implemented all the regulatory th authority we had as a state, um, we could hit 5.8%. If we zeroed out all those things, that would be the refineries, Gatsby Power Plant, uh, things like that. If we made all those zero with our regulatory authority, we still uh, wouldn't be able to attain the standard. Now, that's a good question. Yes. So that blue part, the part that's naturally there, where there is it? Is that like in the Salt Lake Valley? Is that like across the entire state? Where, where is that? Is it, it, it is. It's, it's across the, the entire state. In fact, see, if we go back... Two slides. Oh, three slides, one more. So, so this uh, graphic, uh, I know it was too small to, to read, but um, so these are all the monitors in the state. And you can see that um, even very rural and clean areas, including uh, one that operates just outside the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument is also very close to meeting that standard. And so those monitors that are only impacted by back background ozone are uh, within 90% of exceeding the standard throughout the state. Part of that is that our elevation makes it more efficient to form ozone in the atmosphere. So ozone takes the precursor emissions from those natural and man-made sources. Sunlight interacts with those and the higher you are in elevation and when there's less humidity in the air, that reaction is more efficient. And so uh, Salt Lake and Denver are pretty, particularly challenged because of uh, th this issue that we have more background information, or information, uh, background uh, concentrations of, uh, of ozone here. And it's also uh, our elevation, it's more effective at converting those background emissions 
into the actual pollutant that impacts public health. Bryce just noted this problem is worse in our area of the country than it is anywhere else in the nation. We are uniquely facing this particular challenge. Right. Sorry about that. And so uh, what are we doing? Um, this is our, our full four fold strategy. Uh, first of all, uh, making everything, every attempt we can using the tools that we have and public information education to meet the standard. That's the, the thing that's best for everyone. Uh, provides that public health benefit. Again, that one hat we put on and also um, helps us in this uh, convincing EPA to not exercise some of the discretionary authority that they have. Uh, next one is, uh, there is a provision in the Clean Air Act that, oh, sorry, next bullet on that same slide, sorry. <laughs> uh, there is a provision in the Clean Air Act that if an area would have attained the standard, but for that impact of international emissions, uh, there's a, a process to go through and exclude those values from what you're compared to or what's compared to the standard. And so we're preparing a modeling demonstration. It's called the 179B analysis uh, for under the Clean Air Act. Um, and, and we're going to be submitting that in conjunction with our data certification later this fall for the current planning period. Uh, the next one is a litigation strategy. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of discretion and policy that goes into uh, how EPA implements the standards. Uh, we think that, uh, especially with respect to 179B, uh, EPA already rejected one of our demonstrations. Uh, we think that they were not reading the Clean Air Act uh, as they should. And so uh, there's a litigation strategy as well uh, in preparation for that. And then uh, the last one is uh, we're not alone in this. I mentioned Denver, but there's actually 18 other states that uh, probably have a very difficult or impossible path to meet this current standard. And so there's a multi-state letter that the governor's office is coordinating with to uh, work with EPA, perhaps even work with Congress to uh, amend the Clean Air Act to, to address this, this issue. Um, the Clean Air Act has been very effective for the past 33 years at uh, reducing levels of, of exposure, but those mandatory provisions of the Clean Air Act don't make sense often for an area that has had so many bites at the apple already. And, and again, we've seen uh, big reductions. We've um, attained our winter uh, fine particulate matter standard and uh, currently getting redesignated with that, but we're actually meeting the monitored values for that standard. But this new ozone standard uh, is particularly challenging. As well, um, EPA is likely to propose a new PM standard later this year and another ozone standard probably this year as well. So this is a, a, an issue that we're probably not done with um, and, and is particularly a challenge for us. Next slide now, sorry. Okay, so what are we asking our, our partners to help us with is, um, one is um, we're identifying reasonable emission strategies. Uh, we can continue to do that. Um, some examples, uh, the Air Quality Board has out for public comment right now, a new uh, rule that would uh, limit um, two-stroke lawn care equipment uh, during high ozone days. Uh, this equipment, this is a string trimmer, a weed eater, uh, during those high ozone days, uh, not use it for a couple days or convert it to an electric option and, and use it all the time. But this is one of those strategies that we think uh, is reasonable. It has impact, but it, uh, you know, it, it recognizes that as a population center, we, we do need to make progress. Um, again, there are some various compliance options, waiting a few days to do that work or uh, purchasing electric option. And then we're combining that with incentive programs to be able to convert that. That uh, rule as proposed would, provide, would apply first to what we call institutional users, which would include cities, um, non or uh, um, large institutions, uh, universities, things like that that have lawn care and maintenance company or lawn care and maintenance activities on, on their, their property. Uh, the second year, it would apply to uh, residential users of that equipment. Then the third year would be the small commercial, uh, small business uh, users of that equipment. But again, combined with incentives to, to soften that. Um, Bryce, if, yes. I, if I can interrupt a minute, it, would, it may be useful uh, to the Air Quality Board to receive favorable comments with respect to these proposed regulations, which are currently out for public comment. So um, I don't know if WFRC feels comfortable doing that um, on, on behalf of its members, but um, I certainly encourage individual agencies and municipalities to take a look at that and consider submitting comments. 
And then I also often get the question, since so we brought this up, uh, why a string trimmer? Remember, a string trimmer that uses mixed oil and gas has no catalytic converter, has no computer controlling its, its timing and emissions. So using a string trimmer for an hour is the same as driving a modern vehicle with your whole family to Disneyland um, that, that has the equivalent emissions. And so that's, first of all, recognizes how clean cars are and, and the transportation sector, how clean it is now, but uh, it is an outsized uh, impact and especially those, the, the two stroke engines that we're focused on. Um, then uh, again, UDOT and, and we are working together to get this information out and work as we can. Go ahead. Just maybe a point of clarification. You have reallocate incentive funding to purchase electric two-stroke equipment. Isn't it electric in place of two-stroke equipment? Yes. Okay. That, that is what it I was like. I've never said. heard of electric two-stroke before. <laughs> Bryce, uh, thank you. Does that conclude what you got? It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mayor Silvestrini, to your point, again, Mayor Silvestrini serves as a member of the Air Quality Board. Um, and I think your notion, I'm looking at Kip Billings, actually, who is on WFRC staff and is our transportation conform, air quality conformity expert. And if, if you all think it makes sense for WFRC to submit comments to the Air Quality Board in support of the, uh, the regulations that, that Bryce was just talking about, encouraging the use of electric, not two-stroke, <laughs> then that makes sense. It's not directly our area, but it relates to our ability to conform. So I'm seeing nodding and Kip isn't saying no. So, um, so we can move in that direction and we can also share information with you as a follow-up to that meeting so that you can consider this as well. You as individual mayors and county officials, you can also share information with your residents about using electric uh, equipment, garden equipment, and the incentives that are available. Bryce, there is sort of packaged information for people to share, isn't that right? Yes. So we'll, we'll share that with you, thank you, okay, to pass along. Um, the last point that Bryce had on the screen there said, we're working with the transportation agencies and partners to update our transportation plans um, to make sure they are as updated as possible prior to the possible imposition of a freeze and when we can no longer update them, at least until we get out of a freeze. Um, and so that's one of the things we do here at WFRC. Again, we update the regional transportation plans and the transportation improvement program. We are in, so as a preview, we are anticipating in March and May at our cycle of meetings in March and May that we will be bringing to you an amendment to the regional transportation plan. This is in due course. We do this regularly, but there is an enhanced focus on it because this might be the last bite at the apple of an amendment that we have for some period of time. So Jory Johnner, who manages that work here, is doing that in collaboration with UDOT and UTA. So just anticipate that coming in the March and May um, cycle. Last thing I'll say is we're working on this issue with many partners, uh, DAQ and DEQ, uh, UDOT, the governor's office is very um, engaged in this. Ivan Marrero is here from the Federal Highway Administration and, and we're working with FHWA on this. It's a tricky issue, it's a frustrating issue, uh, candidly, but we're doing everything that we can, that multifaceted strategy that Bryce laid out to try to um, both improve our air quality and human health and avoid the negative implications of the, of the regulatory um, sanctions. Yes. So, the, so among the other, th among those things, one of the things that we have done, we've collaborated with, with uh, MPOs, uh, or similar organizations to, to WFRC and other states like California and Arizona, to send letters to uh, the, our congressional delegation as well as the, the leaders in transportation and air quality in Congress on both sides of the aisle, I believe, to try to get some relief for Western states with respect to this regulatory structure, which is so confining for. A, state like Utah that has so much background ozone. And we're not, the, we're not alone in that. Other, other Western states have the same problem wherever you have high altitude and sunlight and, and the pine trees, I guess, and, and the air blowing from China, you have these problems. So we are trying to address it on that level as well. But that's a really tough challenge given the fact that we're, you know, we'd be asking to roll back some environmental um, regulations, which are sacred or sacrosanct in some quarters, and it's a politically dicey thing to try to get done. 
So you mentioned you've talked to some of our federal delegates. Where are they on this? How involved are they? So we've talked with them about this. I, I, I think that they would be generally supportive of it, but you know they are the ones that have to deal with um, with the folks, other folks in Washington, their colleagues, to try to get any traction on this issue. But we, you know, at least we, um, I would hope, have you know at least at least some bipartisan attention to this, given that California has the same issue. Right, and it's not like we're trying to avoid it. I think it's an education piece. So, Andrew, in that revision, uh, um, and w if there is potential for additional uh, programmable revenue um, coming out of the session, can there be a different approach to sort of how pri projects get prioritized in that phase one and as part of whatever revisions we may look at in the spring? Yeah, Carlton, thank you. We are, as we're moving towards preparing our uh, proposed amendment to the regional transportation plan, considering not only the needs and project timing, but also the availability of, of revenues and, and having a degree of certainty about what revenues are going to be provided helps us in doing the, uh, having certainty into the, into the amendment process. So yes. Bryce, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. I don't have anything happy to say after that. So <laughs> we're just going to move right along. Wow. Um, but I accept that I appreciate the work being done. Thank you for that, for the um, everyone, for the work being done. But messaging uh, that we could put out to our residents about, I mean, that was that was really interesting, just that one data point about the um, trimmers, right? One hour of a two-stroke trimmer is equivalent sure. emissions to driving your family to Disneyland. Is that what you said? <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, that alone. I'm like, there are some things we can put out that people can relate to very easily that, you know, so information like that is helpful, but anything we can do to be helpful, please let us know. Okay. Could I, and I apologize, I know we kind of almost moved off of this, but that just made me think about, do we have communication strategies to articulate all of this information that are ready to come out at some point? I don't know if we are totally there and I don't want to presume anything, but certainly that is such a that is such a visual for me to hear that stat, and I just thought maybe there's an opportunity there. So, Braden, thank you. Thank you. All right, Executive Director, are you ready to report? I am. We do have some really cool things here, and really thanks again for all the work being done on that. Let us know how we can partner. Take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, members of the Council. The only thing that I have to report on today in my Executive Director's report is that I am thrilled to be able to introduce to you four awesome new employees that we have at WFRC. Uh, the first one, Nate Curry, right over there, Nate, is our new communications manager. Now, some of you may remember Nate if you've been around for a while, uh, because he, about a decade ago, he worked at Envision Utah after getting his master's degree in uh, city and metropolitan planning from the University of Utah. Then he was actually in Denver. Uh, he worked at our peer agency, the Denver Regional Council of Governments doing communications. And then he was the head of public relations for the Denver Regional Transportation District. Um, now, before he came back to Utah, though, Nate spent the past year volunteering as a humanitarian aid worker in Ukraine, in the, in the war-torn area of Ukraine. And um, Nate, after the Regional Growth Committee meeting that we had last week, Nate actually reflected to me that the last time he was in a meeting with a group of elected officials it was with the mayors from eight cities and towns on the front lines of the war uh, in Ukraine. And, and Nate said it was okay to share this here, but he noted, like those of you here that are on our council, those mayors, they were elected during peacetime. Uh, and then they had all taken on the terrible mantle of becoming wartime mayors. And so they were dealing, Nate told me, with evacuations of families and children and procuring pellet stoves for warmth in the winter and backhoes to clear infrastructure that was destroyed by missile strikes while, of course, mourning lost loved ones and members of their community. And so just imagine yourselves, right? You're doing this job now, and then that happens unexpectedly. And Nate um, reflected on how truly fortunate we all are to be able to be focused on our future growth and prosperity of our region, which is something that our peers in Eastern Ukraine and other war-torn areas of the world can only hope and dream of at this point. So, Nate, welcome. 
thank you for that service that you did in Ukraine, and thank you for sharing that um, sobering and important reflection to us. Okay, next uh, we have Madison Avilas. Where's Madison? Madison, stand up for a sec. There's Madison Avilas. Madison um, is our new local administrative advisor. So this is a, a newly created position. Some of you may remember this from the last legislative session. The legislature authorized funding so that we could hire somebody, there's people around the state doing this, to provide technical assistance principally to small rural communities. So Madison has a degree in political science and master's of public administration from the University of Utah, but she and her husband actually spent the last several years in Nevada where she was the city manager for the small city of Carlin in Elko County, Nevada that has 2,500 residents. So she was a city manager for a small rural community um, which just makes her a great fit to be the local administrative advisor here and helping our, um, our local communities. So she's going to work with those small communities, uh, understand their needs and priorities, and support them in no small part to help them handle the additional state requirements that you're all aware have been adopted in, in recent years for, uh, for local communities. So welcome to Madison. Two more folks both of which are in our community and economic development group that Meg Townsend leads. Uh, first is Tim Watkins. Where's Tim? There's Tim. Um, uh, Tim is joining us as a community planner three. Doesn't that sound inspiring? Community planner three. Um, uh, it's three because Tim has over 20 years of planning experience that he's bringing uh, to WFRC. He worked as a planner with Layton City, uh, with the city and county of Denver also, and most recently, he was the planning manager for Cache County here uh, in Utah. And he's going to be supporting our communities, you, your communities, uh, as you're doing with our technical planning assistance. So, for example, planning and implementing city and town centers. And also, he has a particular interest and expertise in the economic strategies and impacts of differing growth patterns. So Tim is going to be doing that work. And then also in our uh, group is Matt Ryan. Where's Matt? No, there's Matt. Uh, Matt is um, a community planner one, uh, and what that represents, reflects, is that Matt just graduated in May, uh, also from the University of Utah. We do have people from BYU and other schools. There's just a theme here with uh, University of Utah, uh, go Utes. Um, also with the Masters of City and Metropolitan Planning, uh, Matt jumping in to help communities also with your planning needs, working principally in our transportation and land use connection program, which you remember this is a joint WFRC, UDOT, UTA, Salt Lake County funded program to help you deal with your challenging issues of uh, uh, growth in your areas. And also he's going to be looking particularly at helping our region plan for and develop parks and public spaces, which are critical to our quality of life. <sighs> so those are our awesome four new employees. Please join me in welcoming all of them to WFRC. And Madam Chair, unless anybody has anything else for me, that concludes my executive director's report. Thank you. Thank you. I've had the chance to visit with each of these new employees and just, they're so great. We are excited to welcome you to this amazing team. You've joined the best team and we're just glad you're here. Thanks for coming to, to work with all of us and with this amazing team on important work here. Thanks. We welcome each of you. Okay. Um, our next council meeting will be on Thursday, March 28th. Uh, we have some other upcoming events. Those are all listed on the agenda. Um, I, I did have a note to mention this right now at the end of this movie. It is Mayor Burton's birthday, and it is... It, it, did I say at the end of this movie? Whoo! You guys, I think I need another one of these. The end of this meeting. Um, yeah. Um, happy birthday, Mayor Burton. Um, thanks for spending it with us here. <laughs> we appreciate you and wish you a happy birthday. Okay. Um, it's our favorite time. It's time for our Open and Public Meetings Act training. And so I, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. That will be effective at the conclusion of the video that will play. Um, a, a lot of us in this room um, have that training in a variety of settings. Um, however, it will be playing, and we appreciate um, attention and making sure that we are all um, appropriately recertified and uh, confirmed that we have uh, taken our our uh, Open and Public Meetings Act training. So with that, uh, unless there's any other questions, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn that will be effective at the end of the video. We adjourn at the end of the video. Second. All right, all in favor, please say aye. aye. At the end of the video, we'll adjourn. Aye. And thank you all so much for being here. Appreciate you, thanks.
So what's the Open and Public Meetings Act? It's the state law that ensures government actions and deliberations are openly conducted. Before we continue, keep in mind that this video is an overview, and exceptions may exist based on your entity type. So what's considered an open and public meeting? It's when a governing body majority meets to discuss or act upon government business. It includes the meetings sometimes referred to as workshops or executive sessions. Regular meetings, public hearings, electronic meetings, and emergency meetings are all open and public meetings. Open and public meetings don't include chance or social meetings. A public hearing is a type of open and public meeting where citizens have a reasonable opportunity to speak. Public hearings happen when a government adopts a budget or imposes or increases taxes or fees. An electronic meeting is a type of open and public meeting that's convened electronically, such as via phone or the internet. Remember, the governing body must adopt a resolution, rule, or ordinance allowing and governing electronic meetings. An open and public meeting may be closed to discuss any of the following. A person's character, competence, or health, security personnel, devices, or systems deployment, collective hmm. bargaining, litigation, purchase, sale, or lease of property if an open discussion would prevent the entity from completing the transaction on the best terms, investigations of criminal misconduct, and private or protected information per the Utah Procurement Code, including trade secrets. Two-thirds of the governing body need to vote yes. yes to close a meeting. Quick math lesson. Two divided by three equals 66.7%. Let's say your governing body has five members. If three out of the five members vote yes, that equals 60%, which is not equal to or greater than 66.7%, which means you're one member short and instead need four out of five members to vote yes. During a closed meeting, a governing body can't interview someone applying mm. to fill an elected position, discuss filling a midterm vacancy or temporary absence, discuss the character, competence, or health of a person whose name was submitted for consideration to fill a midterm vacancy or temporary absence, or approve any ordinance, resolution, rule, regulation, contract, or appointment. If a closed meeting is discussing a person's character, competence, or health, or security personnel, devices, or systems deployment, no recording or minutes are required. However, the presiding member needs to sign a sworn written statement stating such. If the closed meeting is held for any other reason, a recording must be made. Emergency meetings may be held to discuss an urgent matter due to unforeseen circumstances. In order to hold the meeting, the best notice that's feasible is provided of the time, location, and topics to be considered. An attempt is made to contact all governing body members, and the governing body majority approves the meeting. Entities that hold regular meetings need to provide notice at least annually of the year's meeting schedule. As always, the notice must include date, time, and place. For entities that don't hold regularly scheduled regular meetings, 24 hours notice must be provided. All meetings, whether regularly scheduled in advance over the course of the year or scheduled as needed, must provide no less than 24 hours notice of meeting agendas. Uh -huh. If a public hearing is held, public notice requirements change. Make sure to distinguish between regular meeting notice requirements and public hearing notice requirements. For regular meetings, an entity is only required to notify a newspaper and doesn't need to pay to publish a notice. For public hearings, notice must be published in at least one issue of a newspaper. If a newspaper of general circulation isn't available, written notice is posted in three public places within the entity's boundaries. Regular meetings require 24 hours notice. Public hearings require seven days notice. For both regular meetings and public hearings, written notice must be posted at the principal office of the governing body, or if no such office exists, at the building where the meeting will be held. Governing bodies must also provide notice of open and public meetings on the Public Notice website at publicnotice.utah.gov. By posting on the website and providing the email of the local newspaper, governing bodies can also meet the requirement to notify a newspaper. However, other requirements such as publishing in a newspaper still apply. Typically, posting on the public notice website is done by the records officer, recorder, or clerk. However, it's the governing body's responsibility to ensure notice is provided. State Archives has prepared a training manual and quick guide for owners and posters, as well as training videos that can be accessed at their website 
at archives.utah.gov. If your entity is increasing a fee or undergoing truth in taxation for a property tax increase, be aware that there are additional notice and posting requirements. Public meeting agendas need to include reasonably specified topics to be considered, with each topic listed under a separate agenda item on the meeting agenda. The governing body may not consider mm. a topic in an open meeting that mm. wasn't on the agenda. Uh -huh. If a new topic not on the agenda is raised by the public during an open meeting, the governing body may discuss the topic. Mm -hmm. However, final action may mm. not be taken on the new topic during that meeting. Meeting minutes and an audio recording are required for all open meetings, with limited exceptions. When an open or closed meeting is required to be recorded, it must be unedited and contain all the portions of the meeting. Recordings of open meetings must be made available within three days. Every entity needs to establish procedures for the governing body's approval of minutes. Pending minutes are written minutes prepared in draft form and are subject to change before being approved by the governing body. Pending minutes must contain a clear indication, such as a draft or pending watermark, that the governing body hasn't yet approved the minutes and that they're subject to change. Pending minutes must be made available within 30 days. Approved minutes are written minutes of a meeting that have been approved by the governing body. Approved minutes are the official record of the meeting and must be made available within three business days. Whoever is responsible for taking the minutes during meetings, typically the records officer, recorder, or clerk, needs to be familiar with what OPMA requires be contained in the minutes. When a governing body closes a meeting, the following must be publicly announced and entered into the minutes of the open meeting at which the closed meeting was approved. The reason or reasons for holding the closed meeting, the location where the closed meeting will be held, and the vote of each member of the governing body either for or against the motion to close the meeting. The recording and any minutes must include the date, time, and location of the meeting, the names of the governing body members present and absent, and the names of all others present except where disclosure would infringe on the confidentiality necessary to fulfill the original purpose of closing the meeting. For more information, access our local government resource center at resources.auditor.utah.gov.